While I mentioned earlier that we have to be careful about relying on Google and web searching to find useful secondary information for marketing research, that doesn't mean that there is no role for using useful web tools. For example, Google Trends can be a very useful tool to get a sense of what the public is interested in, or at least what they're searching for. For example, I think fanny packs are really cool, and I want to see if fanny packs are finally becoming that hot trend item that I really think they deserve to be. So we just simply head to the website trends.google.com, and we can enter a search term. So let's search for fanny pack. And by default, it shows us the results for the search interest uh, fanny pack in the United States. We'll stick to the US for now. And we'll look for the past five years. And clearly, just looking at this chart, we can see that interest in fanny packs peaked around summer of 2018. And although it has declined since, has maintained so far a slightly higher baseline than it did previous to 2018. Let's compare it to the, snert, uh, the search term Snuggy. And what we see here is that the fanny pack has definitely outperformed uh, in terms of search interest than uh, Snuggy. And something else that's interesting, if you look at Snuggy, notice how there's cyclical peaks in the search term. Where do you think that's coming from? Notice how it's mostly during December, holiday season, so people are purchasing these products as gags, uh, sincerely, or they're responding to surges in advertising campaigns for the Snuggy product during the holiday season. Now, keep in mind when we look at Google Trends, any search terms that you use, there will always be one point that peaks at 100. It's always relative, meaning this across the timeline and search terms that we've specified was the peak most interested uh, search term that was used. We don't know the absolute number of searches that was actually done. We can just do relative comparisons. So to show you what I mean by that, let's search for maybe a more common, persistently popular phrase uh, in fashion like purse. Clearly, we can see that purse overall is a much more popular search term. And the search interest in purse is now benchmarked to 100 right around the holiday season of 2019. So that's what I mean by these are relative search comparisons. So here we can, at a quick glance, see that overall fanny pack is a relatively more popular search term than Snuggy, and the search term purse is much more popular in general. To wrap up, it should be clear that there's some key advantages of using external secondary information. First of all, secondary information is readily available. We are in a data-dense world when it comes to marketing in today's environment. Of course, it can be a little overwhelming to novices to know where to find the particular types of information that they're looking for. Secondary information is usually very inexpensive compared to primary research. It's also very quickly obtained. You're able to completely skip over the actual uh, execution of the research project and come right to the results and the analysis. In addition, secondary information can be an excellent supplement to your own primary research. Finally, it does help you define the scope of your primary data needs. Any marketing research project should start with a search for internal and external secondary information. If those sources do not adequately address the question that needs answering, then because of those gaps in information, it becomes much clearer the types of information that it has to be gathered through primary data collection. With that said, there's numerous disadvantages of external secondary information as well. Perhaps the most overwhelming feeling that you'll have when dealing with external secondary information is the sense that you'll almost have found exactly what you needed. Instead of finding the precise piece of information that'll actually answer your research question perfectly, you'll find something very near it, and then you have to make a judgment call about whether or not it's sufficiently adequate for your purposes. These first three disadvantages represent that almost there, but not quite there feeling. Oftentimes, external secondary information will come in an inc incompatible reporting unit. For example, maybe you have information at the county level through an se external secondary source, or you have information about craft beer drinkers in San Diego County, but because you plan on doing a direct mail campaign, you really need to know information about craft beer consumers at the zip code level. If you don't have that level of detail, you have an incompatible reporting unit, 
undermining the use of secondary information for your answering your marketing research question. Oftentimes, the secondary information that you intend to use also has a mismatched problem. So for example, perhaps you find information about the number of beers that people typically buy in, in a week, but what you really need is the amount of money that they're spending on beer. So if you're a craft beer manufacturer who is looking to increase your prices or start to offer more expensive six packs of higher quality beer, it might not be enough just to know the number of beers that they're actually purchasing. You need to know which types of people are actually spending large quantities of money. However, if all you have is the number of beers that they're buying, you're left to make an assumption about how those two numbers correspond to one another. Finally, oftentimes secondary information will come with an unusable class definition. For example, let's imagine a secondary database where they define affluent households as households that make over $100,000 a year. However, maybe you're a marketer of extremely high-end luxury bathroom fixtures. And your experience has taught you that actually to you, for you to sell successfully, you have to target households with income above $250,000 a year. If you have a marketing database that defines affluent households as having 100K or more, that means that anybody that you're analyzing will include, will include a large quantity of, of households that don't actually meet your criteria. This can be frustrating and, and questions whether or not the secondary information will be useful for your purposes. Fourth, secondary information is often outdated. Earlier, when we showed you the GFK University Reporter data, we saw how here in 2016, at the time that this video was taken, the most recent information that we actually had reported was spring 2014. This is a challenging question for marketers to deal with. Is information from over two years ago appropriate and useful for today's market? Or is that information sufficiently outdated that there's a need to collect primary data to answer your research question? In the fast moving world of marketing, data can become outdated very fast. If information collected is more than a year or two years old, often a very difficult question has to be asked whether or not you can really rely on that information. Finally, external secondary information is, by definition, collected from somebody else, not you. Therefore, the quality of their research may be ambiguous. You're going to have to look very close to figure out whether or not the way that they conducted the research is of sufficient quality that you can trust these results for your particular research question. In the, in the next video, we'll do precisely that. We'll learn the sequence of steps that you, the marketing researcher, always have to go through when deciding whether or not external secondary information is of sufficient quality that you can use it to answer your research question.